thank you, Andrew. And, and thanks, uh, Natalie, and everybody here at Elalta. As I have to say, it's really like a pleasure to be here. Uh, I guess for me and for many other people who, whose work is really somehow difficult to categorize and to you know, really uh, locate uh, in between different disciplines, uh, you know, a kind of crossover between contemporary art and, and, and tactical media and, and investigative journalism and many other things. For me and, and for all these other people, I think the Lighthouse had been really like a kind of reference point and inspiration for, for many years. So it's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to start with a, with a quote that I think somehow encapsulates a certain way of looking at the sea, at the ocean, that the project about which I will tell you uh, tonight, I think, tries to, to challenge. And the quote comes from a, a book of Henry David Thoreau, uh, Cape Cod, um, uh, 1864, and it goes like this. We do not associate the idea of antiquity with the ocean, no wonder how it looked a thousand years ago, as we do with the land, for it was equally wild and unfathomable anyways. The Indians left no traces on its surface, but it is the same to the civilized man and the savage. The ocean is a wilderness reaching round the globe, wilder than the Bengal jungle and fuller of monsters. And, and in fact, Thoreau uh, was certainly not the only one to you know, share this idea of, uh, of this vision of the sea for many philosophers, novelists, geographers. Uh, and political thinkers, the ocean has really remained a, a kind of exceptional space, a lawless and unknowable zone that stands somehow as an absolute antithesis to, to history and society. If geography somehow express, expresses the possibility to, to read and, and therefore to, to, uh, to write, sorry, and therefore to read the surface of the earth, the ocean uh, and the liquid territory of the sea seems somehow to stand as an absolute opposite to uh, spatial analysis and the possibility of, of reading a surface, right? And, and this image uh, from this, this detail from the Mercator map of the late 19th century, as well as many other maps uh, up until today actually seems to confirm this idea, right? You have a land which is more or less, you know, uh, greatly defined, where you have places that are indicated with names, uh, you have like a certain topography with rivers and mountains, etc., etc., and then you have the, the ocean, which is a kind of empty uh, space where you have monsters, where you have uh, ramp lines, which are these lines that were used for as navigational devices, and basically it's it's a space to cross, right, and not really a space to inhabit or, or where anything relevant happens. And in fact, the ocean about which I want to tell you about. Today, it's, it's in fact very different from these descriptions. It's very different from its representation as an empty frictionless space imagined or rather I should say perhaps dreamed of by contemporary logistical operation. Um, and it's a space that also defies recurrent descriptions of it as a great void uh, uh, where nothing happens. The sea that uh, we will engage with is a space that in fact it's, it's rich and thick with events and connection a space increasingly contested and striated by conflict, but that also offers unexpected possibility of escapes, and, and for that reason also becomes a kind of central space of politics. It's a space, I think, above all, cost constantly registered in a multiplicity of sensors uh, that turn certain physical conditions into digital data according to specific sets of protocol, uh, protocols determining in this way the conditions of visibility that you were also mentioning, uh, Andrew, of certain events, objects, and people. Um, because as you will also see in the video that I'm going to show you in, in, in a few minutes, more and more visual and spatial information about what happens in sea is being registered and archived and transmitted. Uh, however, it is true that Events at sea often occur outside of the public gaze and thus largely remain unaccounted for. Um, the death of migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean and reach Europe are no exception to this. While between 1988 and November 2012, the press and, and NGOs reported more than 14,000 deaths at the maritime border of the EU, so in roughly 20 years, a bit more, 
uh, including more than 7,000 in the Sicily Channel only, and this does not include the last like incidents in Lampedusa where like almost more than 600 people died in October. Um, the conditions in which these uh, deaths have occurred have rarely been established with precision and the responsibility for them has seldom been determined. And this is a map produced by one of these NGOs that for, that for years has been campaigning against uh, this, this transformation of the Mediterranean basically into a cemetery, Migro Rop. Uh, it's a coalition of NGOs and they have produced a series of really interesting maps where they actually locate several of these deaths and, and so you know the, the big circles are the number of people who have died in the attempt to cross the Mediterranean in the various like points. Uh, so the Canary Island, Gibraltar Strait, Central Mediterranean and, and uh, Aegean Sea. It is in relation to the challenges posed across this liquid frontier that together with Charles Seller, a colleague and friend of mine, I started uh, in summer 2011 the project Forensic Oceanography. We wanted to critically investigate the militarized border regime in the Mediterranean Sea using imaging, uh, imaging mapping and modeling technologies in order to document the deaths of migrants at sea. By investigating and documenting several of the cases in which this, uh, this has happened, uh, we demonstrated that traces are indeed left in water. And, and, and that through the vast process of dataization that I have mentioned just before, the sea has in fact become a vast and extended sensorium. Uh, and this is the claim in, of our project in a sense, it has also become a sort of digital archive that can be interrogated and cross-examined as a witness. All these notions, I think, are quite well encapsulated by this image. Um, this is a satellite image, um, one of the satellite images of the central Mediterranean that uh, Charles and I acquired um, in the attempt to document a case in which 63 migrants died as they were left drifting for 15 days in the open seas despite the numerous encounters with other ships and, and aircrafts, etc., etc. And this is actually the subject of the, of the video, the film that I'll, uh, video animation that I'll show you in, in, uh, in a few minutes. So the image depicts a portion of the Sicily Channel uh, that stretches from Malta that you see up there at the top to the coast of Libya down there. Um, it was taken by one of the satellites that routinely and uh, constantly scanned the Straits of Sicily uh, for many different purposes, among which that of controlling illegal, immigra uh, illegal migration. So, uh, basically, these images are also acquired by Frontex, for instance, which is the European uh, Border Control Agency, and many other, uh, you know, the, the national border agencies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and in fact, what we did, or what we tried to do, was kind of repurposing this image uh, from an evidence of illegalized migration to uh, evidence of the crime of, of non-assistance. And I will show you in a, in a second how we did this. So we bought it in 2012 for uh, $675. So, you know, it's kind of uh, available, like commercially available, it's sold and can be bought on the market. And it was taken by uh, a satellite called Ambisat, which carries like a number of, of different sensors to register many different conditions. And among those sensors, there is this um, synthetic aperture radar, uh, which is a radar that beams pulses of radio waves onto a specific area from an antenna that then detects and records the various echo, wa uh, echo waveforms that bounce back from the Earth's surface, right? So properly speaking, this is in fact not really a photograph or a picture, if by that we understand a kind of recording of visible light by an optical sensor, right? It's rather the visualization obtained through a series of post-processing techniques uh, of the information that the radar has recorded as a consequence of this kind of like interaction with the Earth, or, or rather, in this case, the, the sea surface, right? Um, and if we zoom in, I think that we start to see how this idea of the ocean as an empty and uniform uh, area that I've mentioned in the beginning starts to somehow break down, right? As we begin to distinguish textures, objects, surfaces, and events. So the first thing that probably 
jumps to the eye is you know this different like level of of darkness right so the the black and gray and and white almost which actually just indicates the different uh, levels of sea roughness in specific areas uh, then the other things that that stands out is this kind of striping which is in fact uh, probably linked to data transmission or to an error in data transmission or to the sensor response, which is a kind of fairly common uh, systematic error in satellite images acquisition. And that can also be quite interesting in terms uh, of the metadata, uh, metadata that one can acquire uh, in relation to the image itself. And then if we zoom in even a bit more, uh, we start to see a series of these bright pixels um, or returns, how they are called, like in, in jargon, let's say, uh, that as confirmed by a remote satellite, remote satellite, uh, sorry, remote sensing specialist uh, we work with, represent several uh, large military ships uh, that, as reported by the survivors of this story, were in the vicinity of the migrants' boat but did not intervene to rescue them, right? And here uh, you see basically what we produced. Uh, starting from, uh, from this image. Uh, so you see uh, this drift model that indicates the location where the, the migrant's boat was in yellow, and i explain you later how, how we produce that. And then you see all these different uh, dots with uh, the analysis of the remote sensing specialist who basically gives a certain like uh, percentage that quantifies is uh, certainty that those bright pixels are effectively a ship or not, right? Um, and also the estimated length of the ship. So basically what you see, it's a very kind of crowded sea uh, with, in the middle of it, a boat that has been drifting and that has made known its location to many, you know, authorities and rescue agency, but has which has never been actually rescued. Um, what we don't see on the other end uh, are probably other migrants' boats uh, that are probably present in this picture, uh, but that are not registered by its pixels because of their small size and of the relatively low resolution of the image. So somehow they, they remain below the threshold of detectability, right? They are too small to appear as a pixel. Um, and I guess this for us was also quite interesting. And, and already, I guess, from this you know, first, uh, so you know, like in between this kind of noise of the pixels, there are probably other migrants' boats. And I think just from this very first example, you can start to understand how notions of visibility and invisibility play a fundamental political role, right, in this space, and uh, especially in the context of border control. The very word clandestine that is used or now mainly as a kind of derogatory term to refer to, to migrants uh, and to kind of designate those who have been rendered illegal by the kind of global regime of mobility comes from, the Latin, from a Latin word that uh, specifically means hidden, right? And, and refers precisely to the attempt by the migrants to go undetected. Um, I mean, of course, I think I'll get back to this because of course, it's not as uh, straightforward as it might seem because in certain occasions, of course, also migrants want to be very visible, especially when they are in distress, right? They are often the ones who call for, for help uh, the Coast Guard. Um, but I guess in the context in which remote sensing is so central to the process of policing illegalized migration and the success of clandestine border crossing really hinges uh, on not being detected, the question for us when we started working on this project was really how to avoid becoming complicit with the governmental attempt to manage migration by shedding light on the transgression of borders, right? How can we account for the violence that is produced at the border while at the same time not somehow undermining the attempt by other people to, to cross the border illegally, so to speak? Um, so the use, I guess, of these technologies uh, that we also use a lot for, for in our work um, demanded that we position ourselves strategically, I guess, in relation to their usual application by border agencies. And the video that I'm going to show you now, in fact, explores some of the dilemmas and issues that you know, emerge from, from this situation. Um, so now I'll switch to the... 
here. Okay, um, this was basically the story, the kind of the investigation that started the project, what you have just seen. And um, so this video was produced for an exhibition in Berlin um, called Forensis, uh, which was somehow the outcome of, of a three-year uh, research project of which I've been part based at the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths. Uh, that really try to look at various ways in which digital technologies and material objects could, uh, could be used as, as evidences or uh, proofs of, of human rights violations, crimes against humanity and, and, and things like this. And uh, I guess, so what I would like to do today is simply uh, now, I mean, for you know, for the remaining time, I don't know how much time do I still have. Sorry, fifteen minutes, right? So I just, yeah, perhaps we'll go through uh, a bit more in detail. So here in the video, basically, I've seen the story, and and now I, I will tell you a bit more about how we constructed the story, right? And how this, so somehow the story of the story, and and so the story of the story starts. Uh, in May 2011 with this article of The Guardian by uh, Jack Schenker, a brilliant journalist who, together with other journalists, had been investigating this case uh, together with uh, Stefano Liberti from uh, the Italian El Manifesto and, and also Emiliano Boss from the Swiss Radio, who had been in contact with some of the survivors of this case and, and f were the first one who really like made it public. Um, in response to this, a coalition of NGOs, mainly French, uh, released a, a press release in which they were saying, well, we cannot accept that you know, this is going on, uh, something like this is going on. We'll bring NATO, European states who are participating in the war, uh, the US, etc., etc., to court for the crime of non-assistance. Of course, non-assistance at sea is, is, a, is a crime, according to international law. Uh, and so the idea was really try to you know uh, build a case around this this event and many other events that were happening at the time, as as we men as it was mentioned in the video. In 2011, there was this paradoxical situation in which uh, the Medi Central Mediterranean was probably the most surveilled area in the world, and yet it was a time in which there was a record number of deaths in the Sicily Channel. Right. So how is it possible that all you know these people are not uh, being seen with 38 military ships there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we got in touch with them and we started to think, you know, how can we uh, produce like a kind of visual and, and uh, technical and, and uh, uh, somehow spatial report that would help understand, you know, what happened and also would help a, a judge or and a jury understand what happened. So the first thing we did was meeting with uh, some of the survivors, well, especially one, we did a longer interview with him and other people that, because this became immediately a kind of, you know, very large collaborative project with many people involved in the NGOs and other researchers, et cetera, were involved. And so we did a kind of small part in all this, and, and uh, one of which was going and interviewing Danaile Gebre, who, whom you have seen. Um, and I guess the kind of interview that we were trying to do with him was somehow very different from the standard human rights interview that you're probably used to, right? Where you ask people, you know, how they felt and, and, and how, uh, you know, their, their rights have been violated, etc. Because here we were really trying to, with the help of, a lot, you know, of, of like presenting him with images of the, of the <laughs> Uh, military assets that we knew were in the area, or asking him to draw uh, certain like uh, words or certain like uh, proportions or certain like elements, uh, really trying to understand in a very kind of material sense 
and really try also to ask him about, you know, situ very banal thing like, you know, daylight or, or night or, you know, wind or, and then trying to cross-reference all this information with like, you know, meteorological reports and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, another thing that we did uh, was using, you know, part of the kind of, you know, assemblage of technologies that I've been mentioning before uh, that are you, uh, now used to monitor basically what happens at, at, in the ocean. The, the ocean is somehow an increasingly urbanized space, right, where you have also a lot of, as in the city, a lot of sensors that record what's happening, you know, water temperature, salinity, wind, and all these kind of things, right? Of course, these are mainly done for scientific and, you know, research purposes, but these data are used uh, routinely by, uh, again, border controllers, as well as, you know, NGOs trying to, to document the deaths of migrants, as, as we did. And this is just a map that shows some of these uh, the location of the drift, some of these drifters or, or floaters, how they call them, which are these like autonomous, um, uh, how should I say, like uh, things that are deployed in, in, in various areas of the ocean and then transmit via radio signal information about, uh, as I was saying, water salinity, temperature, etc., etc. right? So you already get a sense of somehow a space that is increasingly uh, mapped and, and, and uh, analyze, right? And so we started working with an oceanographer uh, in, uh, head, at um, Woodsall Oceanographic Institution, which is one of the biggest oceanographic institutions in the US, who did a lot of work also on, on modeling the drift of the remains, so for instance, of the flight, not, not the Malaysian flight now recently, but the one that um, sank in the, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean from, from Brazil to France. And he assembled data from various meteorological stations and was able to produce this drift model, which, as you see, incorporates somehow a margin of error because we know where and when the migrants arrived on, on the coast. So there, you know, the line is much uh, thinner. And then, you know, it becomes uh, bigger and bigger as we proceed toward the point in which they started drifting because we have less and less information, let's say, uh, of course, it's like, it was a kind of reverse engineering of the drift, right? Um, then, as I was mentioning already, we used satellite imagery, although, as you have seen in the video, and you also, as you can also see here in this image, in fact, I mean, also satellite imagery is not really providing a kind of, you know, panoptical vision of the sea where, you know, you can see everything and, and everything is there. I mean, this is just like... Uh, a document produced by the council, uh, sorry, from the GRC, which is the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, which shows basically the density of images taken in a certain amount of time over different areas, right? So where it's darker, basically there are more images, and where it's uh, um, it's lighter, it, there are less images. And basically, I mean, these patchwork and this pattern changes constantly, right? According to many different like conditions, you know, like these task satellites are tasked to take pictures by companies, by research institutes, uh, by the militaries, by the border controllers, etc. So this pattern really variates a lot. So again, we really had to kind of compose different, uh, different images, like this one that I showed to you already. Then we relied on, on AIS data, which is a kind of transponder that is uh, compulsory for ships that are over 300 tons that basically sends information on their uh, position, course, and, and a few other things to coastal station. So we acquired uh, historical data about this, this, the position of the different commercial ships, uh, which you see in, so these are the tracks of these ships, basically. Um, and we compared it with, you know, uh, the returns from the satellite imagery confirming that more, most likely, I mean, those returns belong to uh, military vessels who are not obliged to have these transponders, right? And so, uh, and, and this, of course, was also logical because there was an arms embargo at the time over the, off the coast of Libya, so all the ships or the main traffic, let's say, was staying north of that. Um, then we acquired the uh, distress signals that are sent um, via um, VHF 
onto you know the different ships in on, on at sea basically and that are also then available on the internet we talked with uh, uh, father zurai who uh, as we as you saw in the video is like this quite extraordinary character this uh, eritrean priest who in the past 10 or 15 years has been receiving I mean, basically, his number, his phone number, circulated widely across the Eritrean and Ethiopian diaspora in Africa. So, you know, those that from Eritrea and Ethiopia come to Libya or to other places to try to cross the Mediterranean. And so he has been receiving for, you know, in certain summers, basically, I don't know, like five or ten calls a day for people that have been in distress at sea. Uh, we have talked with the fishermen in Mazara del Vallo, which is a town in the southwestern uh, coast of, of Sicily, which is the biggest uh, fishing fleet in the Mediterranean, and where basically each of the trawlers there um, keeps a record. So those lines are basically the, 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 the lines where the trawling, uh, you, you say, no, trawling, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, where basically they, they put the nets and, and, and uh, swipe the ground of the, on the floor to catch fishes. And of course, I mean, for them, it's important to you know, know where they have been and where they catch fish. But of course, through this process, they also find, so you see there, uh, it says barca in Italian, in Italian um, which is boat. So sometimes you know, they find wrecks, they find you know, bodies or, or, or uh, remains of people, right? Um, we have consulted uh, Plain Spotter's website, and as also this was in the video, it was really important to find an helicopter who, which had the writing army uh, as the you know as the survival say, which is in fact something quite unusual because in fact there were no land operation in the in the war in Libya, so you know we were wondering for some time if that was accurate or not. Uh, and in fact, finally, we found out that there were indeed like uh, helicopters who, who had the writing army, uh, British ones, in fact. Uh, although, of course, the Ministry of Defense, as, immediate, as soon as we released our report, has immediately said that, of course, it was not their, uh, their assets who had been involved in this. Uh, the military, who is also increasingly like, I guess, especially in a time of spending review, probably they are also increasingly willing to publicize, let's say, their activities and, and release more and more information about what they do, right? And I guess in this sense, I think the kind of, probably the, the, the secrecy, the level of secrecy that, or, or the strategy of secrecy that we imagine for, for the military, that we usually imagine as something, you know, that tends to hide information. In fact, here, we found out, we found out was working in a slightly different way where, the military was in fact releasing quite a lot of information, but all that information was buried among you know, a, a mass of, of other information and, and basically spam where you, know, you didn't like, it was difficult to make sense of, of what you were seeing, right? And in that case, basically information became noise until you are able to actually somehow decode it, right? So this is like a... a, a a slide that we took from a DOD, Department of Defense, a press conference uh, that happened in, in Washington in March 2011. And then, as I was saying, there were you know, a lot of like, people collaborating on this, and uh, there was a very interesting uh, report by the Council of Europe as well, who managed to obtain this, this um, sorry, aerial picture of, of the boat that um, was taken by a French surveillance aircraft, and, and many other information that basically are, you know, constantly and, and again routinely collected by border controllers and then assembled in this kind of maritime, uh, into what they call maritime recognized picture. Uh, so, you know, like a, a kind of uh, an idea of a situational awareness of what happens at sea. And basically the kind of, uh, all this information have been somehow assembled. Uh, all this, you know, like extremely high tech and low tech uh, information, human and non human testimony, uh, digital and very kind of analog sort of, of information were combined into this map that summarizes 
uh, with you know a caption uh, that goes with it, summarizes the events of the boat and, and really locates what happened where. Um, so all this information went into a, a report uh, that then became, uh, basically was attached to a series of legal cases that are still ongoing uh, against unknown people for non-assistance of, of, of people at sea. And uh, so far, basically, it's impossible to do this case against NATO directly, NATO being an international organization. So the, the group of lawyers that we have been working with have uh, had to somehow split the, the kind of the, the legal case into the singular national cases. And what the, all the singular national uh, judges are saying, more or less, until now, is that basically it was not they don't deny that this happened, but they say, well, it was not you know, our army or our navy or, or whatever. But nevertheless, the, I think this map really managed to somehow travel across you know, uh, like dif very different contexts and, and, and uh, arenas and, and forums in a sense. So this is like, it was attached also to the Council of Europe report. It arrived on the BBC, on, on El Pais. It, it went on to, you know, um, activist leaflets, etc. And I think for us it was really interesting to see also the circulation of the map itself and how, uh, you know, it could travel. And, and this kind of precision of mapping of this, this event probably for the first time allowed really to, to grasp something that had been happening for a long time in very precise terms. And this allowed, let's say, our report also to have a certain visibility that probably you wouldn't have had if it was just a kind of more, let's say, general accusation of, of what had happened. And so maybe just concluding, I think we are uh, already over time. I guess, uh, so I just would like to end by suggesting, in a sense, a different way of, I guess, of looking at all these images, all this data and, and sounds that I've been talking about. and. What they do, I think, or what they did at least for me and, and for Charles and for all the people who have worked on this project was really somehow not offering, let's say, a, a new image of migration or a new image of migrants in a sense, but rather trying to contest what is to be seen into those images that are already there, right? And, and, by, and we try to do that by focusing on the possibilities that these digital documents offer as almost a really as mere things that circulate across different forums and which and in which different people somehow can participate right and so in a sense i think something that we learn is that really nobody has the power to somehow put an end to the circulation right and and really dictate what is to be seen in a certain image or in a certain satellite uh, data, et cetera, right? And, and this was made very apparent to us by the example of, for instance, uh, mobile phone recordings that migrants themselves do on the crossing, right? And then, then become really, they, are, they circulate along uh, a lot uh, across migrants' communities as they become also a kind of source of pride of, you know, saying, okay, I've, I've made this, right? I, I was able to do it and, and I survived and I'm here now to tell the story. So in a sense, they, they really also offer all these videos and we have acquired a lot of them really offer a very different image of, let's say, of the migrant as a victim that, you know, is, is trafficked and there's no agency, etc. cetera. And, and, um, and so it was very important for us. And at the same time, those very videos now, and then I can take the sound off. Uh, this is like, one of those videos, now increasingly these videos are being used by the Italian police to identify what they call, uh, let's say, the smugglers. So the people who drive the boat, which in fact, I mean, 99% of the times are just migrants that, you know, get a discount basically on the, on the, on the crossing. Uh, but, you know, they use it. So, so this very kind of video who somehow because we always thought of as a kind of, you know, uh, uh, tool of resistance in a sense of something that could offer a different image, etc., is now being recaptured again in the machine of the, in the machinery of the border, right? And, uh, well, now you will see, basically, here you see the rescue operation, and then 
it's just edited together uh, so here they they arrive on the at the port and the next one is uh, so this the, the this guy who is taken uh, who is arrested as the smuggler right and so the video itself becomes evidence against him that he was in fact a, in fact the one driving the boat right but it could also mean and i'm concluding here uh, you know, another example of this, I guess, probably more uh, inspiring is the way in which the, uh, the moms and the relatives of the so-called disparu, uh, the disappeared, how they call them, so the Tunisians who uh, left in, in 2011 Tunisia by boats and never actually made it, so probably disappeared at sea. Uh, still, the mothers uh, of, this, of these people are, are campaigning uh, in Tunisia and, and really asking the government to you know, account and to tell them what happened to their sons. And they do that also using uh, these images that you see here, which, are, which they take from um, newsreels uh, you know, broadcasted in Italy, where you know, if you could listen to the, you know, to the, uh, to the story that they tell, you know, it's a hopeful, like, you know, very kind of racist, like, idea of the invasion of, of people arriving, etc. And still they, they are able to take, you know, a screenshot, they use it as, as proof that, in fact, that son was, in fact, in that image, so, in fact, he did arrive in Italy, so he is somewhere, and so the government needs to account for him, right? <laughs> and, and tell something, you know, to, to, to his mother about what happened to him. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lorenzo, for a really quite provoking and eye-opening talk about one of the territories that we don't often think about as being something that's contested. So um, I'm going to open up the floor for questions, because even though I have a few, I feel that there might be some in the audience. John. Do you think that there should be data about place and passage and transport and geography? Which is, which no one owns, which is neutral, which is non political, which can be used by all agencies or the media or whoever to prove that someone has gone somewhere or crashed somewhere? Or, or do you think that it's a dangerous thing that the media or the data about travel that is there is owned by agencies and not revealed for our use? Mm -hmm. So if I think it should be revealed, you mean? Or, uh... Well, I think that you're suggesting that the evidence for these journeys and these, the, these passages should be shared and should be available for all of us. Sure. It's so desirable, isn't it? Sure. But I don't think you quite said that when you were talking. No, I mean, for sure. I mean, one of our demands and, and one of the things that we have, you know, basically we end our report by saying we you know, we were able to corroborate the witnesses' uh, testimonies in a very kind of strong way, and, and we can confirm that, you know, all the story is, uh, it's plausible, right? It, it could have happened like that. And uh, there are many factors that indicate that the story is accurate, right? And yet, at the same time, we also say that, of course, we are not, we, so, and we can indicate that, for instance, there were ships next to you know, the, the boat who could have intervened but did not. What we cannot do is identifying who, their sh who, who these ships were, right? And, and so we conclude by saying, basically, you know, until the time in which states uh, you know, reveal Informations about which are, of course, all there, right? Every military ship has a very precise log of, you know, where it was, when, and what they did when, right? Mm -hmm. uh, until those information are not revealed, it's impossible to say, you know, who it was, right? We can say that a crime happened, but we cannot say who did it, right? Uh, which, in a sense, is also interesting, I guess, to, you know, to think about this also as a kind of, you know, systemic violence, right? It's not just the violence by, you know, a few, let's say, rotten apple that, you know, did not, 
rescue them in that specific case because we know it's something that has been ongoing for, for many years, right? And it's something that is happening routinely. Um, and yet at the same time, of course, like more openness of this data would be absolutely required. Mm -hmm. The other thing, I guess, which for, for me was quite, uh, I, let's say I didn't expect it when I started this, this project was to see how, in fact, how many information are, are already out there if one, again, is able to read them, right? Uh, and, uh, and of course, that implies a lot of like expert knowledge and, and, and of course, primarily also the will to, to read certain facts and events into a story, right? Of course, I mean, uh, you know, you could make comparison with other famous cases of, of shipwrecks, etc., where you know there has been immediately a you know, huge mobilization. Just you know, think about the, the airplane in in Malaysia. You know, of course, it's not a shipwreck, but like uh, something which has gone missing. Um, or think about the Costa Concordia, or you know, many of these other examples. You know, the 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 the, the power and the kind of you know level of information and the level of of uh, you know research that has been done on that, of course, is is not in any way comparable to what happens to to the many people mm. who die in the Mediterranean. Right? I mean, there's an interesting uh, case. It must be in the Second World War of the uh, the Lufthansa boat. It was documented in a Gunter Grass novel um, called Crab Walk, where the uh, a ship of um, it must be in German migrants moving away from Germany crashed and. People weren't allowed to mourn for them. The, the kind of the data and the and what happens to the boat was gradually kind of brought to by testimonies and sort of various photographs and all sorts of things. But that, that because the sea is a political territory mm -hmm. in that respect, who gets to mourn for those deaths and whether those deaths are justified and whether those deaths can be kind of written into that space is interesting. I mean, you mentioned in your talk about that kind of very weird tension between um, revealing information which could show violences and deaths at sea but could also help state violence. Mm -hmm. So by revealing where these migrants are using sure. as, a, as, a, as a powerful territory, could also aid border control mm -hmm. to then monitor and survey that, that territory, but, but not necessarily, again, to assist with any rescues. Yeah. So how do you feel that, that that kind of space can be properly negotiated? How can NGOs sort of help people? Because that's obviously a, a, a cost-benefit situation there mm -hmm. almost, mm -hmm. which is quite a, a cheap way of saying it, but that's the risk that you take, actually. No, so. definitely. I mean, you really, I think, hit a very important point, and one of which we have been, you know, with Charles as well, writing and thinking a lot. Uh, because, as you say precisely, I mean, we immediately realized that, uh, you know, the so let's say the kind of first, uh, or let's say common or standard human rights response would be, you know, to get you know, full spectrum visibility and, you know, to kind of mobilize shame of what, what, about what's happening there. And, and in fact, we immediately realized we couldn't do that, right? Because, of course, there were informations that were also sensitive, right? So migrants do need secrets, let's say, when they want to do the crossing, in a sense, right? And certainly, we don't want to, you know, uh, endanger their situation even more of, of you know, uh, of what they, of, of, of the risk that they already uh, running into, right? So, I mean, it's, it's, of course, you know, I don't think there's a kind of one answer to this question. I think it's really always a very kind of delicate and a very, like, risky as well uh, line, right, that you have to, to go through and, and, and really thinking about, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tricky. And, and that's why I was talking about paradoxes and dilemmas, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. We also, you know, studied other kind of is more historical cases, right? I mean, in 2004, well, actually, uh, I think it will be 10 years in, it was in July, so yeah, in a few days, there was this other famous case of, of uh, the so-called Kapanamur, which was a humanitarian boat uh, that was, you know, bringing like humanitarian equipment to Iraq, so crossing the Mediterranean, and they encountered uh, um, a, a boat of, of migrants, so they rescued them, and they wanted to bring them to Italy, and Italy stopped them, so didn't allow, because of course the dis where people are disembarked mm. is one of the main issues, right? Uh, and so there was really a military blockade, and uh, 
And so the NGO also very courageously, like, you know, tried to, you know, put together a big kind of scandal around this situation. So they invited a lot of, you know, politicians, activists, and people on the boat. And somehow the deck of the boat, I maybe have some uh, images of this. <coughs> So the, back, the, the deck of the boot itself became a kind of, you know, forum where it was discussed, right? Who, you know, what do we do? And, and uh, you know, how is it possible that, you know, Europe has this policy where people are not allowed to enter, right? Uh, legally, of course. Um, but, of course, I mean, that kind of process of, of somehow scandalization had also a, a backlash in a sense because... So finally, after you know uh, a l long negotiation, so they were there, I think, two weeks or something like that. They were finally allowed to enter Italian territorial waters. They arrived at the port, and what happened then was that uh, as soon as they arrived on the port, the migrants were taken by the police and deported mm -hmm. like the next day. And the people, you know, the humanitarian organization, the, you know, the president and the the, um, uh, the captain of the boat were uh, accused of uh, how do you say? Um, let's say, helping uh, yeah. illegal m migration, mm. right, or, or, or yes. Um, and so they were also, you know, they went through a process, they had to, to sell the ship, you know, it was a complete disaster for, you know, the whole organization, mm. et cetera. And this is something that has happened also in the past many other times where fishermen were also, who had rescued people, then were accused of, you know, helping illegal immigration, right? Mm. So, again, it's a very kind of complex, complex, uh, you know. System of negotiation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, really, I don't think there's a kind of, you know, univocal answer. It's really like always a kind of negotiation between different conditions yeah. and a risky one as well, for sure. No, really interesting. Um, Andrew, you had a question still. Yeah, so you started with a picture of the sort of dark and foreboding ocean. Alan, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so... I'm struggling to think of what this might be like if, you, if this story had played out on land instead, if, if there had been some migrants trying to cross a difficult terrain, like say a mountainous terrain between two regions. And, and I'm trying to think what the differences between those two things are. And, and other than the, obviously the dangers of the sea, the open sea, and currents and running out of fuel and those kinds of things, it feels like maybe one of the most material differences is that on land, um, Borders are very well defined. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if, if just a clearer definition of who's responsible for which bit of sea would <laughs> resolve all of these issues. Um, well, I mean, for sure that's part of the story, right? As, as I think we were, like you saw in the video, right, the kind of SAR zone, so the search and rescue area of Malta and Italy overlap. And, and this is something that is happening not only there, but in other places. And Tunisia doesn't have really a clear search and rescue area defined. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's clearly part of, you know, uh, of the picture, right? So it's more areas of surveillance than area, the kind of defined border territories. Um, what do you mean? As in, like, it's more where they are, it is their responsibility to survey that that becomes important to them. Um, yes, although, I mean, even in the left to die boat case, they did enter Maltese, and there it was clear that it was Maltese responsibility. And, and of course, I mean, again, then you have like international law of the seas is particularly complex because then it also says that in fact, the first agencies that get the knowledge of the rescue, of the, of the distress, mm. is responsible to coordinate and you know, to make sure that people are actually rescued. So in this case, it was Italy as well, right? And, it, and then every ship that received the message you know, uh, also becomes responsible for the rescue if they are nearby, right? So it's, you know, uh, what is interesting, I guess, for us in the space of the sea is that you really have like the opposite of what we usually imagine, right? So instead of a kind of lawless space where you imagine, you know, there's no law, in fact, you have an, accum an over like <laughs> proliferation of law, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem is that those laws, I mean, refugees law is very different from the law of the seas, which is very different from, uh, you know, uh, military law during an, arm, uh, an arms embargo or something like that. So, you know, you have all these different regime of law that are really 
fragmented and colliding one with the other. And what has happened is that states have been increasingly using these overlaps and collisions to evade any responsibility, right? I guess, you know, of course, something like this, it's happening more easily on, on C because the space of, uh, you know, in between the, the, the various national borders. So, you know, on land you have like Germany and Poland, right? And the space in between is usually a river, if at all, right? Or, or a fence or something like that. And in the Mediterranean, of course, you have this kind of decreasing zone of uh, sovereignty, right? Which are territorial waters, contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone that often don't even, you know, touch the, the next state, right? So then you have the ICs that, you know, is the area in between. Mm. But again, even on the ICs, we have also different like regimes of, of, of law that, that intersect. So it's, you know, it makes, I guess, this situation much more evident in a sense. So to kind of praise that in, a, in an unfortunate political way, <laughs> interestingly, uh, a nation's boundaries as defined by the UN and geographers and GIS systems are quite finite, but their political ambitions, say for, you know, uh, in Britain, Britain's case in terms of rock or this one little island in the Atlantic, we really, really want to have a 200 mile image around Rockall because it will give us really about a, a, a greatly increased amount mm -hmm. of uh, oil reserves. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to increase our air sea rescue limits to include that. Sure. That's really funny. So uh, we're happy to rescue people 50 miles around or 100 miles around our sea shores, mm -hmm. but we really, really want uh, 200 or 500 miles. Of fishing zones and oil exploration. Mm. So there's a kind of a weird uh, uh, overlapping pie chart. Totally. Uh, economic aspiration, mm. political aspiration, but the humanitarian aspiration of the pie chart is much, much closer to mm. Sure. And um, it's, uh, I mean, it's something also that we write about and, and we, we have talked about this idea of unbundled sovereignty, right? Where you basically, you know, you can expand and retract your sovereign duties and privileges according to basically what you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, it's a kind of very effective and very, uh, and therefore also very interesting space, I think, right? The, the, the space of the sea. In data-centric terms, though, it becomes much more complicated because we know, because we're much more able to measure things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're much more able to delineate where we stand with where other people stand in terms of, uh, of GIS and mm. the, the geospatial map, we know exactly how far we can go legally to rescue people. Mm. And beyond that, we're not going to. Mm. So data and data-centric activity has become life or death. And very political. No, it's a very political sure. space. I mean, it's that kind of weird tension again between sort of citizen awareness and intervention and government Violence. I mean, one of the things that was revealed uh, or talked about during Future Everything this year was um, how we can use the tools that are already afforded to us, the privileges that we already have, to reveal things like state violences or to kind of sh like, like you use satellite imagery. I mean, mm. James Bridle uses Google Image Search or Google Maps to find mm. kind of airfields and military bases. I mean, that data often comes, as you said before, with a serious amount of like knowing how to translate it. And knowing how to what to do with that knowledge and kind of not to feel helpless by it. Mm -hmm. And how do you see people or kind of almost like I, I, I try to use not citizen research because that seems derogatory, but like people <laughs> like kind of using the tools that are afforded them to enact change or to where where governments aren't, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I mean it's certainly one of the let's say topic of our research, but also of you know the whole kind of forensic project that, mm. that we have, you know, we are part at Goldsmith, uh, where you really see, you know, uh, we are collaborating with people who are, for instance, uh, have reconstructed drone attacks in Waziristan in Pakistan. Mm. Um, and they have done that, you know, through like mobile video footage, it has been smuggled out of the, of mm. the region because there is almost an embargo on images on that area. 
Uh, and then through that, you know, again, it's really a, like a slow process of reconstruction and, and, and trying to make sense of, of what you see, right? Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, one of the issues now uh, with the fact that, you know, everybody has a mobile phone and, and uh, most of us has a smartphone that can also just record location and, and, and images, etc., is that we almost have a kind of an excess of, you know, images, an excess of, of footage. And then it's often uh, more difficult to, to, you know, arrange that into narrative and mm. into like uh, something that would allow to comprehend yeah. what's, what's who, happening, yeah, right? I mean, who interprets it as well and for what end? Can sure, be an interesting, sure. So kind of how you frame an image from one side can be different from a particular sort of political agenda. Um, any, more, any more questions at all? Ali, back. I just was wondering how aware the migrants are of those territorial things. Like, how, aware, sorry? How aware the migrants are right. of these territorial questions, or which waters they're in, or who might be responsible for rescuing them? Yeah. Like, would the person driving the boat know, or would anyone in the boat know, or would they just be you know, heading somewhere and yeah. the best? Well, I mean, the, the conditions of the crossing in general really change a lot with, you know, depending on which area we are talking about and depending also on which moment, right? Uh, so now, for instance, uh, in the Sicily Channel, there is this big operation of the Italian Navy called Mare Nostrum that was um, started after the shipwrecks in Lampedusa in October where more than 600 people died. And that was a kind of, you know, response by the Italian government and basically what they've done was deploying these six or seven military ships very close to the to the Libyan territorial waters so in that so now m most of the times uh, you know migrants just you know called uh, they they are told let's say by those who organize the, the 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 trips to call for help after i don't know like four or five hours of navigation or something like that uh, of course, in the past it was also different. Uh, so in this time, uh, usually people were. Uh, so in the time of the of uh, that we documented in our report, that was the time of the uh, NATO intervention in Libya, and at that time Gaddafi was also like actively using migration as a weapon of war, and and the, the Libyan military were almost pushing like people on boats and with in very bad conditions and without the usual kind of, you know, uh, uh, means of, of, you know, like uh, jackets or, or uh, satellite phones, etc., mm -hmm. that usually are at least given, let's say, uh, to people. It really depends, you know, some are, have more information, some have, have less, depending on, you know, who they rely on to organize the, the, the trip and, and how, in which historical, let's say, moment uh, they do that, that, that crossing. Mm -hmm. One of the projects that we have also like started, so after the report, we have kept collaborating with all the kind of NGOs and, and, uh, and activists, groups of activists that, that were involved in this investigation. And with them, we have launched this project called Watch the Med, uh, where, and part of that project is also the idea we have produced these leaflets that we are, you know, we are now distributing on the coast of, of Tunisia and, and Morocco and the Aegean, not in Libya because now it's very difficult to mm -hmm. get access to mm -hmm. Libya at all, right? Um, and in those leaflets, you know, like there are basic, you know, on the one end kind of legal information of what the rights are you know so the you, uh, so the the fact that you peop, the the coast guard and the military cannot push you back to where you left and they have to bring you you know to Europe if this is where you wanted to go and uh, and you know that you have to write to to file an asylum request etc 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 and then there are also some you know like basic safety information and things that you know what to do if the uh, situation in distress happens which number to call and all these kind of things i mean of course sometimes you know people just uh, you know uh, pay a lot of money they are put on a boat they don't know where they are and they're just thrown at sea basically right uh, so it doesn't work all the time of course right mm -hmm. or on the contrary right it's, it's maybe a few times that it could work but still we are, let's say, trying to, to think, you know, also 
basically doing the connections that, that the European governments are not doing, so on, on both sides, let's mm. say, of the sea, and, and, and making people aware of, of their rights or in, in, in different, like, not only, let's say, once they arrive here in Europe, but also yeah. once they are in, in Turkey or, or, or Tunisia or Morocco or whatever. I think there's obviously a, a very large human rights aspect to this. I mean, you have the posters around, posting around Brighton and London with the what to do if you're stopped by a UK border agency guard. Like that kind of like dissemination of information is, is really important, particularly when you are in that sort of vulnerable situation. Sure. Um, I think we've got time for one more question before we finish. Does anyone have anything burning they want to say or ask? Well, thank you very much, Lorenzo, for thank a you. really thought provoking right, again, um, interesting talk. Um, can we have a round of applause for Lorenzo? <laughs>